Hey guys, Mr. Ridgeway here. Uh, so I am, uh, I appreciate how my uh, subtitles sound there, misspelled my name, that was great. Uh, we, we are here with our second uh, World War lesson, um, and we are going to be, a uh, World War II lesson, we're going to be wrapping that up today. Uh, so first, go ahead, uh, complete your class time warm-up, uh, and then we will kind of dive into uh, kind of finishing up this war. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we're going to be um, just kind of, again, uh, because we're going to be introducing a new player today, uh, relatively speaking, um, the cause of World War II, looking at some big key events, uh, as well as we will be taking just a short moment, again, because we've had to compress World War II so much, uh, to look at some of the long-term uh, and short-term impacts of World War II. Uh, and then three... Um, since the Holocaust is such an integral part of how a lot of um, people teach World War II, um, and probably I'm going to guess in something that you've been exposed to or have heard about before, we're going to take a very, very different uh, tack on it. Uh, we're going to be looking at those people uh, for various reasons who were collaborators uh, in the Holocaust. And I don't necessarily mean people who were Nazis. I mean people who actually um, may have been you know, locals in the area and helped the Nazis, uh, you know, carry out the Holocaust or uh, Jewish persecution in general um, and uh, of, of course of other groups. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be kind of taking a different tack on that. So uh, those kind of big things. Um, and then when you're ready, let's carry on. We're going to knock out uh, the rest of the war basically just with our mini lesson. Okay. Uh, so finishing World War II 1939 to 1945. Our essential questions, how do small decisions end up creating large consequences, and how did the U.S. become a global superpower, and will when will it no longer be number one? So uh, right there you can see that one of the legacies of the war is going to be um, really the, the U.S. coming out uh, on top in terms of uh, the major uh, a major world power, and I'll kind of help uh, take some time after the lesson, we'll break down those legacies. Uh, and as you'll see here, lots of small decisions are going to have a very, very big impact on how this war is going to go. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, let's kind of catch ourselves back up with what's been happening in World War II up until this point. Okay, uh, We stopped our first lesson in 1939 in Europe, uh, and then we also stopped our uh, lesson in the Pacific in 1941. So we're kind of a different kind of points, but let's, let's kind of see where we are, uh, take a, take stock of our, ourselves, if we will. Um, so in the Pacific, uh, Pearl Harbor has been attacked. Okay. And you can see down there on the map, uh, that big red ring of territories that is all, uh, basically either owned or considered to be owned by Japan. Uh, so it's really, really flexed its muscles after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and then second, if you look down there at the map of Europe, uh, you can see there that um, Germany has uh, obviously acquired those territories that we talked about before with appeasement that has happened, that has occurred. Um, but outside of that, uh, really, there hasn't been a lot of stuff happening and, uh, you know, through uh, 1939. That's the thing where things are really, really going to change uh, here in the next couple years. So let's talk about uh, what Germany does, okay? Um, so first of all, okay, uh, what happens is that in 1939, on September 1st, Germany is going to invade Poland. Now, if you don't know where Poland is relative to Germany, um, it's just to the right of it on the map. And this is going to be um, the big event that is going to bring... Uh, Britain and France into the war, even though they don't want to, they just realize that Hitler, it's the, if you give a mouse a cookie problem, um, that you just can't keep appeasing him. Uh, so Britain and France are going to declare war. Now, as well, if that looks confusing on the map, like, wait, why is the Soviet Union invading Poland too? Uh, it, it, they did as well. Um, basically, just Germany and then also the Soviets, uh, which means Russia, have just kind of carved that territory up. Now, they're not fighting at this point. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, they just kind of have a non-aggression pact with each other, which means like, yeah, we'll we'll both eat. You know, it's like it's like two people eating different sides of a Subway sandwich and agreeing to kind of stop in the middle. Uh, is kind of the idea. Uh, so. Uh, what, what's really going to change then is, uh, there's going to be about a year of waiting while Germany kind of redeploys its forces. Uh, and what it's doing then is it's getting ready to attack France. Uh, now what has, um, 
going like what what is really going to occur here is that the German High Command has been thinking a lot about why the Germans lost World War One. Um, and the answer that they basically come up with is that they've been fighting the wrong way. Um, so what, what they kind of devise, uh, is this plan, um, that, that's going to really take the French and the British by complete surprise. So, um, the British and the French, they're basically expecting that there's going to be a repeat of World War I. Uh, they're ready for trench warfare, um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're ready for a very prolonged grind, and Germany is not thinking that way. So if actually you look down here, um, at this map, uh, France builds this gigantic line of trenches and bunkers and huge guns called the Maginot Line. They're just, ex they're, I mean, they're ready for World War One, and then right here, uh, there's a little forest where they don't build anything, because they're like, tanks can't go through forests. Uh, again, thinking about the way they, you know, people would think in World War One, it's called the Arden Forest right here. And so basically what then France does, and Britain, is they sit their armies right here in Belgium. And their thinking is, is like, oh, Germany's going to do the Schlieffen plan again. They're going to arc right through Belgium. We, we know how this is going to go. It's going to be a slog fest. All right. And so what happens is Britain and France move their army up into Belgium, expecting this. And what happens is Germany takes them completely by surprise. And if you look here at the map, um, th these brown arrows, that are reddish brown, uh, that is uh, Germany smashing through the Arden Forest. And all of a sudden, uh, they have gotten behind the British and the French. Uh, and the way that they fight uh, is very, very complicated uh, in, in some ways. And I have a whole video on this actually on my YouTube channel. If you look up um, you know, Ridgeway History Blitzkrieg, it will explain that to you. Uh, but Germany has this new method of fighting called Blitz, uh, Blitzkrieg. And basically, uh, France suffers a nervous breakdown um, because of how this kind of warfare uh, is fought. And so their armies are cut off. Uh, and France falls in uh, weeks. That's it. Uh, four to six weeks. Uh, and, and, you know, so what took the Germans they couldn't accomplish in four years um, takes them four weeks in World War II. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. Now, that blue star that you see right there, uh, that was uh, a famous incident. It's, it's kind of weird to celebrate it as a victory. Uh, that right there is Dunkirk. Uh, and Dunkirk was the place where the very last of the British uh, and sort of uh, French armies are there, and they evacuate uh, across the English Channel to Britain. Uh, now, they do successfully evacuate, but that's like saying, like, I successfully retreated. Uh, the Britain, you know, the, the, the British, the very British attitude would be like, oh, yes, we remember Dunkirk, but it's kind of like weird to say, like, I remember something where I, you know, barely got away alive. Um, so, so that's basically how France is going to fall. Uh, and then Germany now has all of Europe except for Britain. So it is literally an island, uh, it, literally and figuratively now, uh, an island compared to the Germans. Uh, now, this is where uh, we, we get a very um, interesting series of events uh, that are really, really important. So number one, um, while invading France and he's uh, attacking Britain, uh, it's called the Battle of Britain, it was lots of bombings and things like that, uh, basically trying to eliminate the British Air Force uh, so that way they could invade Britain. Uh, Hitler had signed a non-aggression pact with Russia. Now that's not like a treaty, it's just basically saying like, I won't slap you while you won't slap me. Um, but uh, all of a sudden in 1941, uh, Hitler invades Russia in what is called Operation Barbarossa, okay? Uh, now, uh, why all of a sudden the sudden change, okay? Uh, this, sometimes this is kind of difficult for people to understand because it seems like the Russians and the, um, and the Germans are friends at the beginning of World War II. Um, first of all, it goes back to what Hitler said that he um, wanted for the German people, which is that word Lebensraum, like living space, that the German people, uh, you know, kind of deserved it, uh, and also those beliefs um, that Hitler especially had in racial superiority over the Russian peoples, okay, that he would call them the Slavs. Um, now, uh, basically what happens in Oper Operation Barbarossa is that the Germans catch 
the Russians completely by surprise. Uh, Stalin, who is the uh, leader of Russia at this time, uh, basically disappears for weeks. Um, for all intents and purposes that we know, he kind of suffers a nervous breakdown. I uh, was not expecting this. Um, and if you can see there, the arrows that are kind of grayish blue, uh, they proceed to march uh, all the way across Russia, almost. <laughs> Uh, and there, there's three groups: that Army Group North, Army Group Center, and Army Group South. They, they see, they can see the the German Army can see the spires of Moscow, um, and the Russian winter closes in, and the German forces stall and they fall short. Um, and, and we'll see why that happens here in a second. Uh, but the, the, the very, very deadly Russian winter comes in. It hits negative 50, negative 60 degrees below zero. Um, very, very similar to what had happened to the Germans uh, in World War I. And uh, very, very similar to what had happened to the French uh, back with Napoleon. So, uh, here's where I, I want you to see that individual decisions do have... Um, some very strong influence on how the war happens. So if you can see there, it says two tough decisions for Hitler. Uh, so we, you, you can pick either one of these um, and argue what Hitler should have done uh, and make sure you explain your thinking. So Mussolini's delay of Barbarossa, you can check that one out, or you can click helping Gr German army group south. Okay, so go ahead and please check those out now because um, in the rest of the video like going on, I'm gonna kind of dive into those. And uh, I want to make sure that you do that thinking uh, for yourself here. So go ahead, pause right now, check it out. Okay, so I'm assuming you paused. Um, let's explain what these decisions are just to make sure that you get them. Okay, uh, Mussolini's delay of Barbarossa. So that, that is Benito Mussolini. Again, he's the leader of Italy. Um, he has a very kind of odd influence on what happens with Operation Barbarossa. So if we look back here at the map, um, you can see the, the invasion is launched in June, which is a particularly late month uh, to do an army invasion of Russia. And the reason why is the later that you push your invasion, the more likely that you're going to run into... Um, you know, the Russian winner. And what had happened is that this man, Mussolini, um, has been, uh, again, he's allies with Hitler down in Italy. Uh, he's been watching Hitler just march all over everybody in Europe, and he's actually gotten jealous. Uh, and so Mussolini decides without telling Hitler that he is going to take his Italian forces and go and invade Greece. Uh, and besides not telling Hitler, which is probably a bad idea considering, you know, he's your your, your main dude, uh, the invasion goes really, really badly. And Germany then has to make a very, very tough decision, and Hitler does too. Uh, do you go and help out your ally and bail him out, uh, you know, save him because he's your only homie, uh, or um, do you let him go and just die and then you lose your only, you know, your, your only help? Uh, well, he decides to go and help him, uh, but the time that it takes German um, forces to redeploy down to Greece to help Mussolini and then to redeploy again to get ready for Operation Barbarossa costs him months of time. Uh, and so Mussolini has uh, a very, very powerful influence on kind of the, t the timing of the German invasion. Uh, and then the second uh, incident I want you to look at was this helping of German army group south. And so if you look here, um, what, what has basically been occurring uh, is that uh, in Operation Barbarossa, Army Group North and Army Group Center are doing great. They're pushing on. Uh, they're basically just smashing face. Um, it, everything's going fine. Okay, and, and uh, basically where Operation um, Barbarossa it has three big targets. So the Army Group North is trying to hit Leningrad up there. Um, Army Group Center is going for Moscow. Uh, and then Army Group South is trying to kind of get down um, into uh, kind of like kind of the Crimea there, if you see on the map. But it's really the oil fields that are down in the, uh, the southern part of Russia. They really want to get to those uh, down places like Stalingrad. Um, and... Army Group South, though, has been the one that's been dragging. It's been lagging. Um, and Hitler has to make a choice. Like, do I go down and help Army Group South? It's kind of like the incident with Mussolini. Um, 
and I lose, uh, I, I could take groups from Army Group Center, and we could come together and help, uh, you know, we could, we could help Army Group South and smash, uh, you know, smash that resistance there. Um, or uh, do I let that flank fall and then possibly I have to defend that later, um, even though maybe I, then I take Moscow because I just let him kind of flounder. Uh, Hitler's decision is to uh, take Army Group South and swing down, um, or Army Group Center, excuse me, and uh, swing down south. And they do this, uh, you can kind of see it on the map there, that pincer move. And they catch million, like, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, Ru Russians they, they take captive, which is great. Again, wonderful. But by the time, again, it takes uh, Hitler to redeploy from the south up to um, the, the center, uh, you know, from the, from the center group. To move them south and then back north again, uh, that takes time. So uh, again, uh, tough decisions having to be made here. Uh, so uh, how we're going to end off the lesson is kind of then looking at um, the United States. So uh, when the U.S. enters the war, uh, you need to understand that everything changes. And the reason why is because the U.S. can just make stuff like crazy. Uh, again, this is not what Japan had thought would happen when they attacked Pearl Harbor. They thought it would kind of sucker punch them out, uh, knock them out quickly, uh, and then the U.S. would sue for peace. Um, it, it's it's kind of the, the story of if you're going to shoot the bear, make sure you kill the bear. Uh, and, and this time the bear has woken up and it is not happy and it's going to eat, uh, eat some face. Uh, so... Um, the U.S. is going to become the economic and military production powerhouse of the Allies, uh, which is, you know, uh, really Britain and the United States at this point. Uh, so if you look down here, uh, this is a graph. And if you look at uh, this, is this combat munitions. So this is stuff that go boom uh, of all the uh, of all the different powers. And you can see here, here's Germany. Uh, here's Japan, uh, here's the Soviet Union, here's the United Kingdom, and then look at 1941, the United States. It's just stupid, okay? And, and by the end of the war, the United States is making more stuff than every other actor in the war combined. Um, and it, uh, again, it, there there is a thought out there, and uh, I myself as, uh, you know, as a junior historian um, tend to subscribe to this stuff that, or to this idea that if you simply make more stuff than the other side has, even if it's not of good quality, uh, that matters, okay? And that has a lot of weight to it. Um, so just to give you an idea, like one mile um, long plant of Henry Ford's, so actually this picture you're looking at the background, that's Henry Ford's uh, car factory that is then returned into uh, making B-24 Liberator bombers. And they're making one of these every hour, 24-7 around the clock. And that's just one mile long plant. Like there's hundreds of these all over the country uh, in terms of different things being made. Uh, so again, the, the U.S. making stuff here uh, is going to be incredibly, incredibly influential. Uh, and not only that, I, I would love to talk more about like all the time that the U.S. is starting to then dedicate into stuff like R&D, which is research and development on military weapons. But we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so uh, let's talk about bringing the, the war to a close here uh, for at least in Europe. Um now, the thing that the Allies know is that, uh, and there's a decision made at the beginning of the war, that they are going to try to deal with Germany first, because you don't want to leave Britain alone. Uh, and so they start to think about, okay, how are we going to eliminate Germany? And it, it, like you could you know, say, like, well, why not just leave Germany alone? Well, you can't do that. Um, you, know, you, you have to deal with Hitler, and, and that has to be taken care of. So that, that's going to mean an invasion of mainland Europe. And they start thinking about how they're going to like, do this. It's a complicated thing if you think about a mass like because again the english channel is there right 12 miles at its like smallest point you've got to get guys on boats you got to get all those boats there at the same time it's got to be organized it's got to be well executed um and so they start planning now um i would love to uh tell you more about d-day um i highly recommend sometime during your life you get the chance to go to europe go visit the d-day beaches um, Utah, Omaha, Juno, Gold Sword, um, but the the easiest thing that I would tell you to kind of 
wrap your head around this in terms of having it make sense uh, is that when the Allies land, and you can see this map here, in Normandy, okay, which is this part of France, uh, there's a lot of deception and a lot of very, very intentional planning that goes on. Uh, and it happens on June 6, 1944. It's called Operation Overlord. You'll sometimes hear it called D-Day. Uh, and the fighting is incredibly nasty on some of the beaches, like Omaha and Utah, uh, and then some others, it's pretty smooth. Um, basically, what happens from here uh, is that after establishing a beachhead, which means just like a landing point where they can bring over more and more and more and more stuff, uh, they're going to kind of swing over and invade Germany itself. Uh, Russia, in the meantime, uh, has been basically pushing back Germany. Uh, they've kind of rallied after holding the Germans, uh, and they are just manhandling uh, the, their way across Germany. Um, it's incredibly brutal, incredibly savage, fighting on on both, uh, both sides. Uh, and, and really, I wish we had more time to talk about it. For, but from that point, um, Hitler's going to commit suicide um, right before uh, the, um, the Russians get him. Uh, and then Germany is going to surrender. Uh, one thing that is, if you'd like to learn more about D-Day uh, and kind of like actually see what it was like, uh, for, at least for Omaha Beach, I would tell you to go watch the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan uh, after you probably ask your parents for permission because it's pretty gory. Uh, you can skip the rest of the movie after that point, but um, the first 20 minutes, most uh, combat vets have said that's probably the closest to what it actually felt like. So, uh, okay, Japan. Uh, now, um... So uh, basically, the you know the the Pacific War is going to be the United States versus Japan again. Britain does not have that that much influence in this part of the world. Um, from this point, uh, it, it's really going to be the, the those two duking it out. Now, the U.S. had decided after Pearl Harbor that it is going to focus on Germany and then kind of play on the defensive against Japan for a while um, because again they want to help out Britain first. Uh, you need to understand two things uh, primarily about how the Pacific War looks like. Uh, number one, it is going to be a naval war because, again, it's the Pacific Ocean, right? Uh, but it's based heavily on aircraft carriers, which is kind of a weird thing to say. Um, but in World War II, most, nearly all, uh, naval fights uh, in terms of ships do not happen uh, with ship firing on ship action. Uh, the real power in World War II is this new thing called aircraft carriers, which are these, uh, exactly what they sound like. They carry massive numbers of aircraft that you can launch uh, from a deck. Uh, and then most of the actual combat fighting in the Pacific theater is from ship to airplane, uh, you know, kind of fighting. Um, so uh, that's kind of how that goes. Uh, the second part that you need to know is that uh, the Pacific Ocean has a lot of islands, and Japan had occupied many of them. Okay, However, it has thousands of them. Uh, so the U.S. has to also make a choice here about what it's going to do. Uh, and uh, the U.S. choice is, do we invade every single little one of these islands, uh, which would take a lot of time and a lot of men, or do we skip some? Uh, and the U.S. makes the choice to skip them. And the reason why is this is because as they're kind of marching their way uh, west across the Pacific, because um, again, as the U.S. like you know gets more and more powerful, um, the thought is that well, it doesn't matter if some of these Japanese people are stuck on some of these islands; they're behind enemy lines at that point. They can't get any more supplies. They don't matter, uh, and that's exactly what they do. And this strategy is called island hopping. Uh, now, uh, kind of an interesting thing you can always go and Google um, after this if you're interested is looking at the stories of the people, uh, Japanese soldiers who were left behind on some of these islands in some cases for like 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and eventually they just get found by some people visiting these islands later. And they're like, uh, who won the war? Like, wh how's the war going? And they had no idea that the war had ended because it was just kind of... Um, you know, due to this island hopping strategy they've been cut off for so long uh, now by the time that the United States gets to um, really uh, ready to invade um, Japan itself uh, that's when um, the uh, a very very difficult choice has to be made and one that's uh, really 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 impactful uh, so there, there were plans uh, to uh, first of all just invade Japan itself it was called Operation Olympic uh, and 
there were most military planners, at least on the U.S. side, expected at least one million U.S. casualties. Uh, the way that Japan fought in World War II was usually to the death, uh, not with very much surrender. Uh, the second option that the new president, who by that point was President Truman, uh, just learned about when he became president was to try out a new weapon uh, that had been tested out in the deserts of um, New Mexico and a few other places, but had never been tested in combat before, uh, and that was the atomic bomb. Now, if you don't understand what an atomic bomb does, uh, you should probably know it's not just something um, that's cheesy and should be like shrugged off as something you get in Call, uh, you know, in Call of Duty after a 30 kill streak. Um, it's a really, really big deal. So what what happens, uh, at least for the early atomic bombs, um, is that they are fission bombs, and what that means is that you are taking the uh, the nucleus of an atom and you are splitting it. Uh, and from that energy that happens there, um, or from that split that happens, an incredible amount of energy is released. Uh, it, it is devastating. And as soon as, uh, when, when the United States decides that this is the method they're going to go with, they're going to try this new weapon, and they drop the first bomb on Hiroshima, uh, 20,000 people die instantly. Uh, like, it, it's, this is a, a huge, huge deal. And then a couple days later... Um, the U.S. is like, hey, want to surrender now? Japan's like, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, we're, we're still going through with this. They drop a second one on Nagasaki. Um, and then the U.S. lets them know, like, hey, by the way, we've got, um, you know, dozens of these in the pipeline. Um, you know, we'll, we'll keep dropping them until you quit. Uh, and at that point, Japan surrenders. Uh, now, you need to understand that uh, using nuclear weapons uh, as a tool... Um, this is the only time uh, that, that nukes have been used this way, uh, is a real, real big deal. Because now that Pandora's box has been opened with nukes, uh, you cannot close that box again. We'll talk more about that in the legacies of the war later. Um, in terms of like the biggest controversial decisions that have ever been made in world history, this is probably right up there. Uh, you know, Number one or number two on, on most people's lists. So uh, again... Uh, it's, it's not something to be joked about. Um, the, you know, Japan will come out of this war uh, basically having a, uh, <laughs> it, not only will they not really, uh, you know, allow an army, uh, they have mostly just like a National Guard kind of, fo you know, force now, but they will like swear off all nuclear weapons and, and these kind of things. Uh, this is, a, is an incredibly, incredibly devastating um, tool. So, that's going to kind of bring an end to the war. So let's take a moment. Let's um, break them, kind of break down some of the bigger legacies out of this. Okay. Um, now it says, uh, list the following uh, large consequences of World War II in your notes and turn them into an acronym. Come up with your own and then share yours with two other people. Obviously, um, in our current circumstances, we're not able to share them. Uh, but uh, please uh, put them down in your notes. Let's, let's talk about some of these legacies and then you can make your own acronym. So first of all, uh, the United States is going to come out of this becoming a global superpower. Uh, for four years, uh, the United States is going to be the only country in the entire world with nukes. Um, that is a big, big deal. Uh, because it could have just gone like and conquered every country in the in the world and no country could have ever stopped it. Didn't do that, That which is nice. Um, but th there you go. Uh, second, okay... When Russia gets nukes, uh, the Soviet Union, I'm going to use those two words interchangeably, um, the U.S. and Russia are going to come out of this not liking each other very much. And this kind of goes into the third bullet point. Uh, the United States and Russia enter a non-shooting competition called the Cold War at the end of the war. And what the U.S. and Russia start to do is start to build up larger and larger arsenals of nuclear weapons. Okay, they, we, they enter what's called an arms race, uh, where they see who can build up the biggest amount of nukes. And, and we'll talk about in future lessons why the U.S. and Russia did not like each other very much. Um, legacy number four, the U.N. is set up, the United Nations. Uh, so uh, back in World War I, uh, or after World War I, there was something attempted to set up called the League of Nations, where basically, um, to put it very, very shortly, uh, countries could come together to talk about their feelings. Like, hey, uh, you murdered Archduke Franz Ferdinand. That really hurt my feelings when you did that, Serbia. Um, let's talk about it. 
Uh, the UN is basically that. Uh, it is a place where um, countries can come together to work things out as opposed to dropping nukes on each other, which is uh, generally as we would probably like to see a good thing. Um, the fifth one, uh, European powers give up their colonies. So the British, after World War II, um, they're not going to be able to keep up uh, trying to hold on to some of these colonies that they've had for a long time. India being one, uh, South Africa uh, being another. Um, and this is also true of, uh, of France too. Morocco, they're going to lose that. They're going to lose, well, not not because they wanted to. Uh, they're not going to, they're, they're going to lose um, Vietnam. Um it, you know, it goes on and on and on. And this process is called decolonization. Uh, and then the last one, uh, the Holocaust, uh, 6 million Jews and then 6 million other undesirables, uh, as the Germans deemed them, uh, are going to die in the Holocaust uh, by the end. So, okay, uh, you need to make an acronym out of these six legacies. Now, here's what I recommend. Number one first, uh, summarize each line into a single word. So, for example, like, the United States becomes a, a global superpower. Uh, I, I would say superpower, S, okay? And I would just go down the line and do that until I have six letters. Uh, once I've got six letters, then I can try to kind of rearrange them to make them into an acronym. Let's say I end up with S-U-P-E-R-S, -E supers. Oh, well, that was easy, okay? Uh, that's probably not what's going to happen. Uh, you might have to go back and, for example, let's say I chose superpower as my word and S as my letter. Um, I might have to go back that uh, back to that and change that. I'm like, oh, I don't have like, I don't have the letters I need to make this word. Let's change superpower. Let's do US. So I do U uh, instead to make my acronym work. You may have to kind of finagle your acronym around in terms of changing some of the words and letters in order for it to actually make sense to you. Okay, this is just a way that you can remember the impacts of World War II very, very easily.